Welcome, um, good to see you all here uh, today for another little talk. Uh, today I'm going to talk about beautiful retina, so I'm obviously a little bit biased because I like retinas and vitro-retinal surgery, so I think they look beautiful even when they've got diseases and problems. In fact, sometimes they look um, almost better that way. Um, and so we're going to show some images of um, today of different cases, which I think are just uh, intrinsically quite nice to look at, but also demonstrate some cases and, and how we use this different imaging. So, you know, wide field imaging, fluorescenes and OCTs to help diagnose and manage, you know, different retinal cases. Um, so they're sort of slightly random cases, but linked by um, being sort of retinal things and also um, having some nice imaging. So hopefully um, there's something to learn and otherwise um, you can have a drink and just look at some pretty pictures <laughs> anyway and collect your points. So uh, I'll do a couple of cases. So this is our first case. Uh, this is a 57 year old man. So he presented with blurred vision in his right eye. Um, he's well. Um, no past um, history of notes, um, but interestingly he had this um, general medical history of having a heart attack at 39, which is obviously a pretty young age to be having that, and femoral artery stents, which means his femoral arteries to his legs would have been sort of blocked off with um, vascular disease. So when he was 55, which is quite young as well, he was a non-smoker, no family history of heart disease. So it was a bit unusual, but I didn't think of anything of it at the time, but um, yeah, quite strange. Uh, he had reduced vision in his right eye, um, a bit of myopic astigmatism, um, normal pressure, no IPD, and normal anterior segments. So we just quickly move through the anterior segments because um, we get to the good parts. So this uh, is a picture of his left eye. So this is the eye with 6-5 vision. Um, so it would be great to get some interaction tonight and getting people yelling out things they see or the names of things they might notice or even descriptions of things. So. Uh, can anyone describe any abnormal findings or even just what they look like or maybe names if you're really keen? Someone's saying some hyperpigmentation? Are you talking about this sort of stuff around here? Yeah. And uh, the nerve looks pretty healthy, the blood vessels look okay. But there's other funny stuff, eh? All this sort of kind of like cracks in the mud or something kind of around here. Um, and yeah, this is, um, this is quite cool, sort of, people would describe it as a reticular kind of a lacy pattern, maybe, I don't know, we'll see in a minute whether you really think that's what it is. Um, if I zoom in a little bit more, which is very zoomed in, um, and so maybe we lose a little bit of clarity, but um, the, these are angioid streaks, these things, um, these little sort of cracks in the mud um, that we're seeing running along here, and this is um, a particular sort of pattern of pigmentation which um, we'll talk about in a minute and then there's this funny sort of speckled appearance out there as well. So one of the um, other imaging uh, modalities we have is um, this fundus autofluorescence. I know um, some of you guys have that in your practices as well as obviously wide field or colour color photos. Um, and so this, uh, so remember in, in this the uh, bright colours are this lipofusin. Um, so you have normal lipofusin in RPE cells, so normal pigment, but um, if you have excess of that, it's generally because the RPE cells are a bit unhealthy or unhappy. So sort of whiter is sick and unhappy RPE. And dark areas are where there's no lipofusin, so essentially no RPE. So obviously your nerve and your blood vessels, there's none. Um, but obviously if there were, was RPE missing or really, really unhealthy and dead or missing, um, then you might have some darker areas. So um, it's hard unless you look at lots of them to kind of say normal, but obviously that, that darker area of pigmentation actually looks quite um, bright here. So that excess pigment that we were seeing is actually accumulation of lipofusin. So, um, and it shows this kind of uh, wreath-like or reticular kind of pattern, sort of a, a lacy pattern. Um, so, but we'll get back to that in a minute. So angioid streaks are um, quite a particular thing. So they're a break in Brooks membrane. So there'll be a little bit of anatomy um, with this, but um, and it, you have this thickened and calcified Brooks membrane, and then you get these focal breaks, which you see as those kind of squiggly lines coming off the disc usually. Um, and then overlying that, you lose then the RPE and the photoreceptors, uh, and you also lose the chorocapillaris, the um, little capillaries below. So you basically get this defect where there's kind of no seeing retina. Um, and the commonest problem that people get is a choroid on your vascular membrane growing. So basically there's a little break in Brooks membrane and blood vessels can grow up through the choroid and then under the retina and, and create swelling and bleeding. So the same process as near vascular AMD, but a, a different underlying reason to get it. Uh, so for some people, um, this is idiopathic, so there's no association. Um, so idiopathic sounds fancy, but it just means we don't, there's no reason for them to have it, we don't know. Um, and they probably have a primary abnormality with Brooks membrane that makes it calcified, whereas 
for some patients with associations, there's some reason why there's more calcium around and that calcium gets deposited and that's why they, why they get these. So, does anyone know why you might lose vision from angiogenesis? Yeah. Or even, a, a, I guess, that it might be similar reasons to why you might lose vision from any macular disease. It could be sort of more general as well. It's not too specific to these. Anyone? So we talked about one um, in that previous slide, so a choroidal neovascular membrane, so, you know, and that's perhaps 80% of people with angiostrix will get that, so that's kind of the commonest cause of vision loss. Um, and then uh, the other one would be just one of these streaks involving the fovea, so as I mentioned, kind of above the streak, if it just goes through the fovea, if you're unlucky enough, you'll have lose the RPE, lose the photoreceptors, so it's just basically there's no vision there. Um, a less common one um, and a kind of specific one to this condition is um, traumatic rupture of Brooks membrane. So even with kind of a more minor eye trauma than you might expect, like a, a, a more minor blow to the eye or even a minor head injury, um, you could get a rupture of Brooks membrane, a little bleed, and if it involved the fovea, that could be bad for your vision. Um, and the other thing is atrophy. So they do um, have this generally thickened Brooks membrane and overlying that, the RP cells become a bit unhealthy and so you can get general kind of atrophy occurring as well. So it's not just choroidal neovascular membranes, which is kind of the commonest one, but there are, are, are some other reasons. <coughs> so there'll be a test after this on um, these conditions associated with angiostrix, but um, thank thankfully um, even we don't try and remember all of these. In fact, um, no one would. So when we do a st study for our part two exams, we have this acronym called PEPSI that we try and remember uh, for why people um, get this. So there's a condition called Pseudoxanthoma elasticum, which will shorten to PXE from here on in because I'll stumble over it too much, um, which I'll talk about more in a minute. There's an Ehlers Danlos syndrome. So these are these people with this funny connective tissue. They're hyperflexible joints when they bend it right back and it's all freaky. To, you don't like the, I don't like the look of that. Uh, Paget's disease is a problem with calcium and bone. So there's, cal there's too much calcium and that's this Brooks membrane calcium you get. Sickle cell disease gets it too, but no one really knows why, and um, this fancy idiopathic, which means we don't know why. So most are idiopathic, and then the next commonest, commonest is the PXE. So Pepsi. Uh, so back to our case, this is his right eye. Um, and so he, he has uh, pseudoxanthoma elasticum, PXE, um, and this picture shows kind of all the features that you might see. Um, so um, he has uh, angio streaks again, so these, these little um, streaky lines running up like this. And sometimes they're sort of circumferential, sometimes they're a bit more linear, um, but they often sort of look a little bit like blood vessels streaking out. So if you don't look carefully, sometimes you can miss them because they look a little bit like a blood vessel, which is why they're called angioid blood vessel-like. Um, uh, there's these little atrophic spots, um, which I suppose just by themselves, you could just see them in anyone, but those coupled with these, uh, and then these comet tail lesions, they sort of usually like a little spot with a little pale sort of tail on it. Uh, and then the speckled appearance is called um, uh, peau d'orange. So if any of you speak French, or that was probably a really horrible way of saying it, but it's like dimpled kind of orange skin appearance, um, which is to do with kind of changes in the RPE. So all of that is just P PXE basically. So you can sort of just diagnose it by looking in the eye. Um, and can anyone see, so this is the poor, poorly seeing eye, can anyone see anything that might have caused the poor vision in this eye or any other abnormalities at the macula? Hemorrhage, yeah. There's a little, little hemorrhage here uh, and we've got some of this pigmentation sort of similar to the other side, but there's also this dark, little dark um, patch here which looks a little bit different, it's a bit bigger um, and it's sort of a different sort of shape I suppose to those other pigmentary areas. Um, Maybe I zoom in a bit more on that. Yeah, that might make it easier. So yeah, a little hemorrhage, a little retinal hemorrhage here in this dark patch. Um, so what, because we're talking about imaging and um, what imaging would now be helpful maybe to work out what's going on there? What, what would you guys maybe have in your clinics as well? You could, OCT, yeah. So we can get OCT and see what that shows. Uh, and um, I guess most of you have OCTs or are reasonably familiar with them, but I'll, I'll just try and orientate you. Oops, I'm going to go too far a little bit. Uh, so um, this, this, this is the slice we're looking at here. Um, but this is the, obviously the cross section, um, and we're trying to go right through that little, um, that little dark patch. Uh, and so the optic nerve would be somewhere here out of picture, um, and here's our fovea. Uh, and so obviously this side looks really healthy and fine from about here over. It's all normal, normal retinal layers. Uh, we've got normal healthy RPE, everything's good here. 
And then so this is the RPE running along here, and you sort of lose it a bit here, but it is still here, so it doesn't come up, so it's not a pigment epithelial detachment, so you, that bright line has to come up for it to be a PED. So there's not a PED there, um, but there is this sort of lumpy something there, which gets called subretinal hyperreflective material, which is literally just saying what it looks like, but it sounds fancier. But it's probably a little growth of new blood vessels, in, at least in some patients, and in a minute I'll show you that it is in him. Um, what's this dark stuff here? Does anyone... Yeah, that's yeah, subretinal fluid. So we know that subretinal because it's um, the photoreceptors are still here and the RPE is here, so it's in that subretinal space. And it's less easy to see, but um, often you'll see cysts if there's intraretinal fluid. But sometimes there's no cysts. And but if you look at these, you know, if you look at these say dark um, layers here, you know, that's definitely a bit thicker on that side than that side. And this retina is just a little bit thickened. Just generally, there's just a bit of diffuse thickening of the retina as well. So we've got intraretinal fluid, subretinal fluid and the subretinal hyperreflective material. So this is a choroidal nevascular membrane that's grown up through the chorus. So there'll be a, it would have been an angioid streak there. It's grown up through there um, and proliferated and, and created this bleeding and swelling, and that's why his vision's dropped. So how do you prove there's a blood vessel there? Well, you can do fluorescent angiograms, which is kind of the traditional way, but now we have um, OCT angiography, which is um, less invasive and um, we can do it more easily and to be fair you could diagnose that one based on the OCT anyway so you wouldn't necessarily do a fluorescein anymore but uh, it's quite helpful doing OCTA to just see prove it and also quite sometimes quite able to show patients and quite helpful to show you guys when we do a talk. Um, so I find OCTA quite amazing so I mean OCTAs are pretty amazing you know the, the level of detail we get and it's sort of revolu revolutionised ophthalmology really you know how we treat um, patients, how we diagnose them, how we monitor for anti-VEGF. Um, but OCTA is one step further, so I don't know if just a, the basics for how it works is um, an OCT scan is taken, um, and then obviously OCT is like going in and coming back, and how much comes back, and how quickly um, gives you kind of an idea of where something is in space, and how reflective it is, how thick it is, um, and you can make a picture out of that. So with OCTA, a fraction of a second after doing that scan, it does another one, and because of all the eye tracking, it can keep the eye still, and so there's no movement. So nothing moves in the eye, the retinal vessels will stay the same, everything's the same. The one thing that does move is individual blood cells. So if it takes another scan, and at the exact same point, there's a change in the reflectance because something's changed, it has to be a blood cell moving. So it says that must be where a blood vessel is. So it maps those out, and that's how it tells where a blood vessel is. So it does that in you know 10 seconds, thousands and thousands and thousands of scans over and over again. Um, and can see where these moving blood, um, blood cells are. So um, it's sort of, I still can't really get my head around how it does it and how it processes it and how it comes up with it, but um, it does, and it comes up with these amazing pictures. So um, you guys probably don't look at OCTAs quite so much, and it's not really too important, I suppose, but if we look at this picture, um, the, this picture um, is showing blood vessels between this red spotty line and this red spotty line. So that little lump is um, that subretinal hyperreflective material we talked about, which I said probably was a bunch of blood vessels. Um, and so this blue line is running directly through there. And so here we've got the blue line there and the green line there. So we can um, tell we're kind of orientated where, right where that is. And um, so there should be no blood vessels down there. So that's lower than the deep capillary plexus. Um, and all the superficial retinal blood vessels are much higher than that. And so the machines have to kind of get rid of all of the um, those blood vessels from the picture and just show you what's in that, in that bit. And so this um, little um, stalk here, then this little sort of frondy thing coming out, so that's a little stalk of blood vessels coming up from the choroid, and then this little frond grows out of it, which exactly corresponds to where that little lump is. So that's just a little growth of blood vessels and vascular tissue that's come out. And you'd see a similar picture with the fluorescein, but um, uh, you can do this without putting a drip in and injecting dye. So um, it just sort of helps confirm and show what's going on, really. And if you don't believe me, we can overlay it onto this. And why should you? You should um, see for your own eyes. So if we overlay it, you can see it sort of corresponds really nicely um, to that little dark area. So that little dark area is actually the abnormal blood vessels in the tissue, um, but you can't see the individual blood vessels. It's sort of a bit too deep and sort of covered by um, some edema and um, obviously retina. Um, so if we zoom that uh, back out, we'll fade it back out. Um, you can sort of see it sort of corresponds quite nicely, and that's obviously where the hemorrhage come from as well, because th these little blood vessels are fragile and leaky and, and, um, and bleed. So that, um, that is why he came in. And so he didn't know he had this condition, um, but it explained why he had this problem with his blood vessels when he was 39. So, um, it's, um, again, this is not really <laughs> sort of a bit specific, but um, it's quite interesting because it's a mutation that affects um, connective tissue everywhere. 
Um, so obviously Brooks membrane is what we're interested in and have been talking about, but it's in blood vessels and everywhere else. Um, and it's this one transporter gene, and, and um, we're not sure what it transports, but uh, if you have a mutation in it, then you get calcium deposition in sort of all sorts of connective tissue. Um, so, for instance, if it's in your blood vessels, it can lead to sort of um, you know, heart attacks and strokes because you get cl clotted blood vessels. Um, same in your peripheral blood vessels, which he had issues with. Um, we'll show some pictures of the skin changes you get. Um, and obviously the eyes we've talked quite a bit about. So you can do a skin biopsy. This is a skin biopsy um, from someone with PXE, which I have no idea what it shows, but um, it just looked pretty. Um, but it would show these specific changes. So that's one way of testing for it. Or you can just do a genetic test, um, and it's quite easy to determine when people have got it. It's also a recessive, which means that usually they won't have a family history. It's just they'll be the first person to have it. Um, and it's uncommon, but um, you know, I'm going to show you probably six or seven patients tonight, different photos. Um, so, um, and that's over five or so years, so you might um, have some patients in your clinics that have it. Uh, so this is their skin changes. So they're described as these little yellow papules, and it's a favourite exam thing for um, ophthalmology exams to see someone's eyes, and then you're meant to go and look around and fossick around their body and find, find these things if you think they've got them, and you get extra points for that. Um, and they'll often make them wear a scarf, so you have to make them take their scarf off to, to look for it, so they don't make it easy. Um, so it's often the neck or under your arm or kind of on, on sort of your, um, your elbow here. Um, and as I see, you can biopsy those and look for, look for um, the diagnosis that way. And management, um, there's obviously some things generally, but really for the eyes, um, I guess if you had a patient with this, we talked to them a little bit about you know, not playing rugby or contact sports perhaps because of this risk with even a minor eye injury of bleeding, um, monitoring an the grid for the development of cordial endovascular membrane. And the ARES vitamins may are probably just more like you want to do something to try and help them because essentially it's a different pathology and, and perhaps there's no evidence that it would work, but it's, you feel like you're doing something if you, if you gave them that, particularly when these are youngish patients and there's a good chance they are going to get troubles later in life. Uh, so, yeah, we talked about some of the reasons people lose vision. So this is a few other images of people with uh, Android streaks and or PXE. Um, and just their history and how they go. So this um, is another patient, and just, I suppose, looking at a different way they look. So uh, here are the android streaks again, these long um, lines coming off the disc here and here. So they look a little bit more blood vessel-like, so you know, on a quick exam you could easily sort of miss those, I think. Um, and we don't have so many of these other peripheral changes, um, maybe a few little comet tail things. Um, and there's an android streak that sort of runs right through here, quite close to the fovea. Um, and then it's just a little bit sort of patchy pigmentation at the macula. And so I think the vision at this stage is about 6, 9.5 in this patient, and then um, about 18 months later, just on with normal follow-up, um, it comes back, and vision's dropped to about 660. And you can just sort of see it's sort of a little bit more pale, choroidal vessels are a bit more visible, it's sort of just become quite atrophic, really. Um, and so that shows up really nicely on the, f um, the fundus sort of fluorescence again. So uh, again, oh, I've pushed the wrong button, no, I haven't, that's good. Uh, so the angio streaks look dark because there's no RPE there, um, so you can see them quite clearly here and here and here. Um, and then these little, there were some atrophic patches sort of already present, these sort of darker patches here. So a bit like geographic atrophy in AMD, but maybe not quite as dark or in a slightly different shape. And then this funny sort of hyper-reflective um, stuff around as well, which is um, this lipofusin. Um, and then if you look at that uh, picture um, when they come back 18 months later, you just see the, there's just this big black space now. So there's basically no, no retina, no RPE in that area, so they've just got a big blank central vision, which um, you really can't do anything about. And so they didn't develop a cord in their membrane or anything, it's just the natural progression of the disease sometimes. Um, uh, this is another patient with pseudoxanthoma elasticum and android streaks, and again just showing that they look different sometimes. So in these ones, the, the streaks look quite pigmented and funny, but they are, you can still sort of see the little streaky things around. Um, uh, and what's this? What, what do you think this represents or is? Or? Yeah, so it's a, um, it's a yeah, a basically, um, I don't know, you, you can call it different things, a disc form scar or fibrovascular, so it's subretinal fibrovascular scarring basically. So I've had a cruel vascular membrane in this eye um, and has poor vision there. Um, and they've got known, known problems and known PXC and then they came to clinic one day saying my other eye is not very good uh, and you can see there's a little, a little hemorrhage on this side so they're developing the same problem there. Um, and again just showing the, um, the fundus autofluorescence just uh, out of interest just showing how um, you know, dark it looks in these areas where 
um, the RP is missing and there's that quite dark pigmentary change and so you're not seeing any lipofuse in there so it's very very dark. Um, so yeah just again sort of showing those um, changes which can be more obvious sometimes on that. And OCT can help uh, a little bit as well so um, this picture uh, is, a, is again of a fibrovascular scar essentially so someone with sort of end stage um, cordial vascular membrane and, and, and pseudo exfoliation syndrome so this lumpy hyperreflective stuff which is hard to tell if it's sub RPE or sub retinoid I can't really tell if it's RPE there or not um, just because it's all sort of messed up really but um, it's just um, would have been blood vessels that, and then bleeding and then it's now sort of a, a, a mature scar and overlying that you've sort of lost all the organisation of the retina you've got a little bit of edema those little cysts there as well um, and this is the fovea here obviously so there's just no um, useful photoreceptors all through here so that's you know a 660 kind of eye um, uh, and this uh, top one here really nicely sh shows an angioid streak. So this is the angioid streak um, seen in cross section. So you can see here, so this is RPE and Brooks membrane and you can't really tell the two apart in this, sometimes you can. Um, and you can see here it's just, it's, there's just a discrete break in it. Um, and then, uh, so we see this nice shine through, so the, the sort of the light from the OCT, because there's no RPE to absorb it, it just goes straight through. So there's a little, um, little gap there where it can get through. Um, and you can sort of see the retinal layers diving down into it. So the, um, the ellipsoid layer, the sort of photoreceptors are gone there too. So the other layers kind of sort of cave in, look like they're sort of caving into it. So you can imagine if that was running through, you know, your fovea, um, again, just if there's no photoreceptors there, you can't, no pixels, you can't see. So, um, but thankfully that one's there. Uh, and this is just another cruel neovascular membrane. So just to sort of to reiterate kind of what they look like with, um, again, um, RPE here, can't really see it here, but it certainly doesn't come up over the top. So again, this is the subretinal hyperreflective material, probably the blood vessels if you didn't know CTA. And then um, you've got all this intraretinal edema here. You can see the big lump where it's um, all swollen. So um, again, another, uh, another way that they can lose vision. So what happened to our fellow? He um, started, as we just about do with everyone, on four weekly avastin injections, um, and he responded okay, but um, we didn't completely control things, so he still had a bit of edema. Um, and so he was switched to ILEA, which we can do with um, the, when, we, when they meet those pharmac requirements of avastin not working um, well enough. Um, but unfortunately, his vision has continued to drop off, and he just hasn't really ever totally responded. Uh, he's had sort of some persistent edema um, going on, and if you look at his, um, so he's about 18 months into it now. So if you look. Um, at his pictures now, um, that little dark area is a bit more sort of I guess, circumscribed and it's sort of, you can sort of see the pigmentation a bit more easily, so it's, it's basically kind of a little scar now really. Um, not the sort of white fibrovascular one, but just kind of a little localised um, deep scar. Um, and he's still got a little hemorrhage here, um, I don't know how well it's a bit orange that picture, but so that indicates it's still active, the, those blood vessels are still there and still not controlled by the anti-VEGF unfortunately. Um, oh, I zoom in a bit. Extreme close up. Uh, and then there's OCT now. Um, so, again, we've got sort of normal retina from about here over. Um, and so here's our fovea. And you can just see here, so again, here's RPE. And this is the ellipsoid layer above that, that next white line. And it sort of disappears here. You just don't see it coming anywhere through sort of all that's a bit messy here. And maybe there's a little bit here. So, uh, and there's still some intraretinal fluid, a little bit of a cystic sort of change there. And that's kind of where those blood vessels were. So they're sort of that smaller and it's all more circumscribed, but it's a little scar. But there must still be some active blood vessels there if there's bleeding going on. So he's lost vision because basically his ellipsoid's gone in that area. So he's just, he's just had active ongoing um, edema. And one day probably we'll have to stop treatment because he won't meet the pharmac criteria anymore. And also his vision's probably just going to drop enough that he's... So we'll keep going four weekly and keep him seeing as long as we can. And keep his fingers crossed he doesn't get it in the other eye. Uh, does anyone have any questions? That's the first case. Does anyone have any questions about any of the images or the types of things? Um, um, well, I read, um, researching this data, I read that for people with pseudoxanthoma elasticum, that um, about 80% of them are bilaterally blind by age 55. Um, so, and that's even in the anti-VGF era, like perhaps they don't respond quite so well um, as, as AMD patients do. So yeah, it's not really a nice thing when you sort of see someone who's 30 or 40 and they've got it in one eye and you just know it's not going to look good for their other eye. So, um, but you know, they, they don't, it's not universal and, um, and sometimes they, I've certainly seen them respond to anti-VGF better than that. So it's not, that's not necessarily typical, but um, they often get that atrophy uh, and that just keeps coming, which 
also happens to typical AMD patients as well. You can treat their wet macular degeneration really well, no edema, no hemorrhage, but they just get that underlying geographic atrophy that eventually comes over several years. So you keep them seeing longer, but eventually it's the dry AMD that, um, that takes their vision and, and it can be the same for these people. Yeah, so that's I suppose some of the key points, just um, yeah, Android streaks so are those breaks in Brooks membrane, so it's just a little anatomy lesson of all those layers again. Um, that pseudoxanthoma elastin is the most common cause apart from this idiopathic, we don't know. Um, but even though it's a very specific condition, like it's got a lot of comparisons in terms of the um, way it affects vision as just typical AMD, which you guys will obviously see a lot more of. Um, and hopefully it showed a little bit about why that imaging can be useful and, and how we use it um, and just how pretty it can look. And um, yeah, unfortunately, NTVGF, although it's amazing, it doesn't work for everyone. And, um, and we sort of run out of good treatment options at that stage, to be fair. Um, uh, but um, yeah, it's probably still slowing it down for him to some degree. But um, yeah, without treatment, he probably lost vision a lot, a lot more quickly. That's case one. I thought we'd do one more little case, and then we'll have a wee break. Um, so. Uh, I, as I said, I do vitro-retinal surgery, so I usually like to have a surgical video or something as well because I find um, the surgery a bit more interesting at times and it's also um, nice to see how you guys react to the gruesome eye surgeries, like some people like them. I'll do it before the lunch, uh, the, the little interval and see how you go. Um, uh, but uh, I just find it quite interesting and this is quite an interesting surgery, I think. So this fellow is 62-year-old, um, so he was chopping wood uh, and just a bit of a flick dumped to his eye and uh, he lost all his vision. Um, but he took a couple of days, I think, to come in because he was sort of a stock guy and um, came in with counting fingers, vision, and an IP of 50, so he, and he had a sublux uh, lens and a bit of cataract. Um, and he had a bit of vitreous hemorrhage, but it basically looked like the back of his eye was healthy enough. So the main issue was the pressure in this, this cataract and, and the sublux just kind of displaced lens. Um, and so, unfortunately, he was seen by one of our fellows who probably didn't know the New Zealand system very well, so he just got put onto a, a waiting list for surgery. They controlled his pressure, so there was no real rush. Um, but because he's ACC, like he can have private treatment, and so he was put onto the public waiting list. Um, and I guess um, he was an electrician, he couldn't work, and um, he was on a benefit, and um, he could have quite easily just come and had private surgery, because uh, ACC will pay regardless of, and we charge the patients nothing, it's funded all by ACC, so they pay, ACC pays whether it's done here or at the public hospital, so, um, but obviously if we can free up a space of public by doing it here, that's really useful, so someone who can't access ACC can have it there, and usually it's just a bit quicker um, doing, it, doing it that way. But anyway, luckily I was reviewing my list and found him, and so we brought him out here to do the surgery, and so he's really happy because he'd been sort of languishing and waiting and hoping that he'd get his surgery. Um, and this is all COVID-related delays and stuff as well, so it's not just the, the doctor who saw him, but they just weren't, weren't, weren't aware of this ACC stuff. So if you see people with ACC issues, um, and you know you can always refer them to any, anyone privately because they, um, it's all funded and it's, um, it, yeah, it basically helps, helps the public system to some degree. Um, so anyway, uh, I don't have a pre-op picture of his um, eye, but this is um, just at the start of his surgery. Uh, so to orientate you, I'm sitting at the top of his head, so um, his feet are that way and his foreheads here um, and so you can see his lens is kind of all the way down there so we can't do a normal cataract surgery here um, so you need the so all the zonules you know are missing kind of all through here um, and they're probably damaged in other places but obviously they're gone there um, so that's looking straight you know into the vitreous um, and there's vitreous all kind of through there and the vitreous coming into the AC is why the pressure was high um, so yeah we need all those zonules intact in the bag intact to kind of do the surgery to, to kind of take the the lens out of the out of the bag, but also um, then obviously to place an IOL, it has to be in the bag and centered and stable. So you can do some tricky, fiddly things to do that. But um, for our surgeons, we sort of do it differently. So we just think we'll take the whole lens and everything away, and then we'll just put a lens in differently. So um, I'll show you the way I do it. Sean's probably shown you videos before of he does this Yamini technique with the little haptics, the little legs of the lens going into the sclera, and this is just suturing a lens, which is just a different way of doing it, which I find a bit easier. So. Um, so ask questions and as we go, because it's basically just, um, I'll talk a little bit through it, but if, just shout out if you want to ask anything or I don't explain it very well. So we're going to do these marks, we've got to suture the lens in, so you have to be really precise with your markings to make sure you get it even and not tilted or decentered. And so this is opening up the conjunctiva to get access to the sclera where we're going to, where we're going to suture and make the little openings. So we do that on one side and we've done it on the other side as well. But And this is all double time by the way, or triple time or something, so I'm not... <laughs> just don't want you here for too long. Um, 
Uh, it also gets rid of little shakes. Um, so this is marking. So that eventually that's going to be where the sutures will come out from um, inside the eye to be tied to the sclera. Um, uh, so that has to be really accurate. And so now we're making, we're just doing a little bit of a vitrectomy now. So this is the same as I do for a normal vitrectomy, putting these little ports into the eye so we can get into the back of the eye and take the lens out and take the vitreous out and kind of tidy everything up back there. So we put one on the other side. And so this is me using the little vitrectomy cutter. So this is usually for removing vitreous. It's not really good for taking lenses away. And this is a reasonably decent cataract. It's probably a three plus nucleosclerosis. So I'm just fiddling around trying to get it. Um, and then as expected, it just drops into the back of the eye because um, it's not held by anything. So this is why I had to do it that way. Um, so you see it's just floating around on the macula, there's the disc. Um, so I clear the vitreous away and then we, um, I, I take that out, but it's a long, tedious process with the cutter, so um, I, that's all edited out. Um, so now there's cataracts gone, and so there's no lens, no bag, no anything. So now I'm going to make some little more openings of those marks I made earlier where the stitches all come out. Um, so doing that on both sides. And so the, the placement of this is so that the lens will be kind of like it was sitting in, in the bag where it would be normally. So it's three millimetres back from the limbus um, where we make the mark. And then we do a corneal um, incision just slightly bigger than a standard one to put the lens in. The lens is a bit hard to see here. You'll see it when it's in the eye, but it's, it's got these little legs with little loops, little holes in them. Um, and so we put this Gore-Tex suture through one and then through the other one. You can sort of see the little bean-shaped sort of hole there. And we do the same on the other side. And then we just got to pop it in there and take it out through the little opening I made here with these little tiny faucet things. Oh, this is taking too long. Um, and then eventually we'll do that on this other side. So you have to be a little bit, this is the only bit I, that's a bit tricky. So when you put the lens in, which you'll see in a second, the sutures can all get sort of twisted around the lens and you can get it flipped and it's all a bit strange. This looks a bit rough, this bit, so just, um, but it's just getting it in and opening it up and it all looks a bit funny, but it's just getting the lens in the right place and opening it out so it's not attached to those forceps and then we can get those out and then you can see the lens is sitting there nicely and you can pull on those, um, you know, those sutures and kind of move the lens within the eye to kind of get it where you want it. Um, and now you can see those little loops really nicely, those little, those little feet. So, um, and that's why this works quite nicely. You have to have these, these special lenses. So these are normal lenses that would go in the bag normally. We don't, we don't use these lenses um, typically in New Zealand, but um, they're still used throughout the world. Uh, it means that um, you're, if you try to stitch just one thing to the wall of the eye, it'd be easy for it to twist, but because there's two points sort of holding it, it keeps it flat and stable, so you don't get torsion and twisting of the lens. Um, so there we go, that's sort of sitting kind of roughly where it's supposed to be. And then we have to tie off these knots, so we do that now. And this, is, again, is just a little fiddly bit in terms of trying to um, get it centred right. So you see I'll tighten this one up and it just goes zing across this side, so obviously that wouldn't work very well. Um, so then we'll tie the other side in a minute and you'll see I have to loosen this side a little bit to kind of let it off. So they're, quite, they're tied quite loosely, um, they're sort of just held there. Um, um, the, the sutures are sort of quite, they're not pulling it right to the edge of the wall of the eye, they're just, the sutures are coming from the outside and actually there's a bit of length of them going in around. Um, so you can see here I'm just tightening each side, just trying to get it centred. Um, and then I think that looks pretty good, so then I just suture it up. So I skipped a couple of steps, but that's the, the suture then sitting. So it just sits on top of the sclera, but it's under the conjunctiva, so you've closed that back up and stitched that over the top. And I've also stitched those little openings I made because they often leak a bit if you don't. You don't have to, but it's just a bit better, I think. And so that's on the other side. And so those connect to those little legs. So they're sort of like a sort of a, sort of a square-shaped um, sort of suture running like that. And the same there. Oh, and there's a little suture in the wound as well. So, um, so that's Gore-Tex. So it last, basically lasts forever. So we used to stitch with things like um, uh, nylon, but they'd break after 10 years. So this guy's, um, I think he's 60-something. 60, 60 so, you know, he might have to have two more surgeries in his lifetime if the suture's just going to break. But the Gore-Tex, so um, we're told it'll last forever, so they suture, you know, kids' heart valves in with Gore-Tex and things like that, so um, presumably um, it'll last this man's 20 years, whatever he needs, so um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how they go long term, but um, they work really well in the short term. And he had a really good result, so you can imagine it's, the refractive result is generally far more unpredictable, because if I was just a tiny little bit further back, you know, with or just a tiny bit tilted, and it's just it's luck a little bit, um, how, even though you try and measure carefully, um, you'll have a diff diff different effect of lens position or a bit of tilt will induce astigmatism. Um, but he just, he just had a good result. He was really happy because he'd been hand movements for sort of six months. So he could get back to work. And this is just a little, um, 
Uh, so he's looking off to the left in this picture, and I just thought it sort of showed quite nicely. Um, so that's the edge of the lens, and that's each little haptic little leg. And you can just see the suture running between the two. And so if you could see the sclera is over here, and so that sort of runs there and then out like that, and up like that again. So he's, um, he's got, this is um, without dilating drops. He's got this massive traumatic mydriasis, but he doesn't want me to fix that. I've said I can kind of try and suture that up, but um, he just wears sunglasses and says it's fine and he's happy. So, um, but it's a pretty big pupil, right? Like, um, so that's that. Has anyone got any questions? So that's suture the rubbing the back of the iron. Uh, no, so it's far enough back, and the way that you loop it through the loops, it should be far enough back. And so it's three millimetres, so the, the pupil plane should be about two millimetres, so it should be far enough away. I've got one patient who I did on who had a, a, quite an extremely deep AC, and I still did it at three millimetres. And it's actually the lens is probably a little close to iris, and there's a little bit of chafe, and so it's not causing any trouble, but it, it could do in the future, like he could get a bit of CMO or you know, maybe you know, even bleeds or, or glaucoma, but touch wood, he's okay at the moment. Um, and so after that case, I had another one who had a very similar thing, because these guys, when they're aphakic, they have quite deep ACs, everything sort of drops, drops back a bit further. So another patient who I did on, and, I, and I this time I was, you know, a bit of experience helped, so I thought, well, that's actually really deep, and I, I need to be a bit further back. So I, um, was four, I went four millimetres back, but then you have this guesswork of what lens power do I choose now. So when you're three millimetres back, I aim for about minus 0.5 or minus 0 0.75, which tends to be, in this, in this case, it was close to emotropia. Um, he was about minus 0.5, but um, if you go a millimetre back, that effective lens position changes, and then you go, well, what, effect, what now, how much do I... Uh, increase the lens power by to still get emotro and so it's, um, it introduces more um, uncertainty about the refractive outcome but um, in that case the lens was much further back and so there was no iris chafe so um, and but it wasn't as good a refractive outcome so he's had, he's, 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 I tell them all they're going to need glasses after and you know we don't really know what this is going to be like but you'll have a lens in your eye um, and you'll you'll be better off and you just need a pair of glasses to see so one more case um, and again just I suppose looking at imaging and how we use it and um, yeah just maybe some interesting diseases as well. So this is a young guy um, who came with a scotoma in both eyes and he had some new floaters. He was well, um, no past medical history, no medications, uh, and he had good vision. Uh, he had no ROPD, normal colour vision, uh, normal pressure, uh, but he had some cells in the anterior chamber, so an anterior uveitis, um, and he had some anterior vitreous cells, so vitritis or an intermediate uveitis, if you want to use the correct term. Uh, so a bit of information in his eyes. Uh, and then this was his optos images, this is the public hospital. Um, and so I, they're a bit small and hard to see in this one, but there's um, some blood vessel, little blood spots and things and something happening here in the left eye, um, but um, also similar and more obvious here. So we'll just look at the right eye. Um, so I'm sure someone like Sean maybe would like to just, what do you see up there? What do you, what, how would you describe it? Hemorrhages, yeah, there's some retinal hemorrhages. Sorry, is it, a, it is a bit dark, isn't it? Well, it looks more like a ghost vessel, but it's a bit different, isn't it? Because it's not like a little skinny, thin vessel, it's sort of a, almost bigger and thicker. It's um, kind of almost wider and enlarged. And uh, here, here it maybe is, because you can see the, um, you can still see the vessel a little bit here, but there's all that white stuff on the edge. But here you really can't see the vessel, it's kind of, kind of completely covered over. Um, so would anyone, if you were, you know, sending sending me a referral on Monday and you've seen this patient in your clinic and you, you're going to try and tell me, you, now you've all got photos, you've probably just seen the photo and say, have a look, have a look, Logan. But um, what if you're trying to describe it to me, like, would anyone, or say what you thought it was, if you were going to give it a diagnosis or something, what do you think? Vasculitis, yeah. So it's uh, definitely a vasculitis. So, it's just, yeah, a little bit more than a ghost vessel. Like I can, it's definitely a white pale vessel. So it's, um, and this, this by itself, maybe without the hemorrhages, could look that way. Um, but this is definitely a, a kind of a vascular, vascular picture. So inflammation around the blood vessels um, with associated kind of retinal hemorrhages. But there's no, um, but the, the inflammation is limited to the blood vessels. So there's no retinitis. You know, you're not seeing um, choroiditis, you know, spots of inflammation in the retina or anywhere else. It just seems to be limited to the blood vessels. But remember, it's also in the vitreous and the. Um, uh, anterior chamber. So um, when you think about inflammation just generally, um, obviously you think about anatomically, so there's anterior, intermediate or vitritis and posterior which is vasculitis, choroiditis or retinitis. Um, and so, but if you've got all three then you get panuveitis. So, and then essentially working out whether it's 
anterior, intermediate, posterior, or all three. You can then get a list of differential diagnoses and go, well, this is, this is maybe what this one might be. Um, and in general, anterior uveitis, whilst it's um, uh, painful often and um, you'll, people come emergently to you and we want to see them to make them feel better, it's far less likely to be an infectious cause, which is more important, and it's far less likely to be sort of visually significant. Uh, intermediate somewhere in between, but certainly posterior uveitis, more likely to be infectious, more likely to be serious and vision threatening and need treatment. So, um, you know, at least in terms of your triage um, urgency, that kind of gives you some kind of idea. And it might also give you some idea of diagnosis if you want to kind of go looking a bit harder. So pan uveitis, um, if you look in textbooks or somewhere, this might be a kind of a reasonable list and there's probably, you could probably add ones. Um, and then we, the, the next step if someone has uveitis is, is it infectious or is it like an autoimmune condition? And so why, why does that matter? Why is that, why is that the next big thing we worry about or think about? Kayleigh might know. No? No. Um, well, so, so here we've got like some of these infectious ones like syphilis, which can just be on any list because syphilis looks like anything and it's always um, fun to tick that form and send them off and try and have a conversation about why you're ticking it. Um, uh, and so these are, all, these are all infectious causes and the endophthalmitis is a bacterial infection within the eye, generally bacterial fungal. So all infectious here and these are autoimmune ones. Um, and so basically, well if you, if you have an autoimmune one, you're going to suppress the immune system with steroids or methotrexate or something like that. Um, to treat that, and that will work really well. Um, and if I give those medications to these patients, they will get much, much, much worse because um, their immune system is what's probably trying to fight their infection. So, um, so that's really the key differential diagnosis, infectious or not, and that kind of um, anatomical thing about where they are, and that gives you a list of what it might be. Um, and to rule out infections, a lot of it's just blood testing. Um, it can be sort of how it looks. Syphilis can look like anything, so you just have to test for it. But um, some of them you might be m more impressed that it's an infectious versus another one. But um, often it's blood tests. Um, you can sometimes, if it was a bit different to this, you might take a, a vitreous sample and check that for PCR of different bugs. So there's lots of ways of ruling it out, but you sort of have to exclude it before you go and um, think it's something that's an immune one. So I thought he might have sarcoidosis is um, sort of what I thought. Um, and if you look at this picture, um, so one other sort of anatomical, anatomical, anatomical classification is if it's more arteries or more veins affected with the vasculitis. So it's another way of narrowing in on what it might be. So do you guys reckon that's veins or arteries that seem to be affected? Or both? We're hearing a few whispers of veins? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so uh, th this is definitely vain, this one, and I'm pretty sure this one is too. Um, that's what I wrote in my notes anyway. So um, the picture gets a bit dark up there, so it's not too easy to see, I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, so if you look at that, that gives you another clue. Um, so if it's mainly veins, so that we call that periphlebitis, um, then it's these sort of things, and if it's arteries, it's these sort of things. Um, and so some of these, like this is acute retinal necrosis, so this is quite a, a nasty disease. Um, and then if it's a bit of both, um, it can be these other unusual kind of arterial diseases that affect all parts of your body. So, um, and we don't need to know what they all are or anything, but again, if you remember, sarcoidosis was in the list of um, panuveitis, and it can look like anything in the eye, basically, a bit like syphilis, and it's in this list for, for periphobitis. So this is what I thought he might have. Um, you don't know until you do the testing, though. Um, and so we don't really still know if he had that or not, because so we did the test, so you do a, this thing called a serum ACE, which was slightly raised, but it doesn't mean you have it. It's just... Um, suggested that he had a chest x-ray which didn't show the normal changes. We took a biopsy of his conjunctiva because sometimes he had little lumps and sometimes they can be little granulomas that show um, down the microscope what sarcoid is, uh, but he didn't have that. And he's well otherwise, so we decided, so you could do a CT chest and look more closely at the lungs, that's the other main part that gets affected by, um, by sarcoid, but um, he's asymptomatic and he's well and we've, we excluded all the other infectious things with all the other testing we did. So we're going to treat him with immunosuppression regardless, so we don't really need to go and radiate his lungs with like a, you get quite a bit of radiation from a CT chest and there's really no point at, if he has it, we're going to be treating him with immunosuppression, which is what you treat sarcoid with, um, so it didn't really matter. Um, but if he developed a cough or chest symptoms, you could do a CT chest and maybe see if he really does have sarcoidosis, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, so this is another one of our beautiful pictures, well I think it's a beautiful picture. Um, it gets a bit dark, but um, so if you remember, his blood vessel was, um, and, um, he had the vasculitis here, and sort of along, let's see this blood vessel's a bit thinner here. Um, so why does this bit look extra dark? 
you might see that here too, it gets a bit dark all wrap here, but it's quite dark around here. Why is that? So this is a fluorescein angiogram. So we've put injected dye into a drip into the vein, it's gone through, it's gone into the arteries and the veins, so it's, um, the arteries um, are looking a bit brighter at this stage and the veins are a little bit darker. Um, and obviously we've got the macular and disc here. So why does it look, do you guys know why it looks, would look darker? Yeah, inflammation blocking, yeah. So because these blood vessels are um, essentially occluded, especially this one, and, and also here to some degree, or maybe at least the side branches of this one. So this, um, this, net, this light, light grey appearance is basically the capillaries filling, so you can't see little individual blood vessels, but you can sort of see this sort of fluorescein in there giving it this light grey appearance. Um, and in here, there's no capillaries, there's no flow through them at all because these blood vessels along here are totally blocked off, and, and, and from here up it's all blocked off as well. Um, so it's really helpful in seeing these areas of ischemia like blood flow. So this is, again, this is a rare thing we're talking about, but um, if you did a, something in someone with diabetes, you wouldn't obviously see blood vessels like that, but you would see patches of ischemia just the same as this, and, and you might see them at the macula, which might affect their vision as well. So, um, so it's sort of a different underlying disease, but similar things that you might see in the imaging. So. Uh, and then the other interesting thing in him is, um, so this is a, a much later phase in the fluorescence, so a lot of the dye's gone out, you can see the blood vessels aren't so white anymore, and the, and the disc kind of stains and becomes whiter. Um, but what you see, so th this was one of the normal blood vessels here and here, so they were obviously abnormal even on the colour photo, but you can see these little, um, these little fluffy bits here and here and here, here, here. So they're all um, leakage and a little bit of um, uh, vasculitis and blood vessels that look totally normal clinically. So you can see it's quite a widespread thing even though it was really only obvious up there. So that's another reason why we don't do that many fluorescents anymore, but sometimes they can be quite helpful. So we um, described him as idiopathic, again that great term because we couldn't really prove it was sarcoid even though I think that's what he's got. Um, pan with this occlusive retinal vasculitis, so ischemic, ischemic retina because it was totally occluded blood vessels. Um, we checked for all the um, toxo and all of those things, syphilis, all negative, um, and he put them onto oral prednisone. And um, this is how he, um, he sort of progressed over a few months. So, and again, this is where this wide field imaging is great because um, once upon a time, we would have just described what, what was going on and then said it looks better or there's less hemorrhages or whatever, but now we have this perfect photographic record. Um, and so if I see them or someone else sees them, it doesn't matter because we, we all look at the same picture and know exactly what's happening. So that was presentation. And then I think about a month later, uh, it looked like this. Um, so you can certainly see far less sort of inflammation around this vein and you know, much better here and maybe a few less hemorrhages. And then I think another couple of months later, um, again, looking even better, so um, very few hemorrhages here now. Vessels still don't look quite normal, um, uh, but and again, this vessel probably hasn't quite come back, but um, there's less hemorrhages up there. Um, so that's just the steroid working on, presumably, for some reason, he's got this autoimmune inflammation, again, maybe sarcoid. Um, it's just for whatever reason gone after these blood vessels, and um, if we damp down his immune system, it gets better. Um, so steroids can work wonders. Then he came back uh, a few months later, and his eye looked like this. So what's changed now? Someone saying blood vessels? What's? Yeah, this, I reckon it's quite. Again, I think it's quite pretty. Uh, this little frontal little blood vessels here um, has popped up, um, which is again what you would see in someone with diabetes potentially, um, but obviously a different condition here. Um, and yeah, you tend to get um, these sort of frondy loop things and sort of you know that they're not normal ones because normal ones obviously just run from the disc and get smaller as they go out and they're sort of heading somewhere and these are just kind of hanging around in a big frond. And if they're smaller, it can be harder to tell, but here it's obviously quite obvious. Um, and then if you do a, f um, oh, I think I zoom in a bit. That might have helped. No, it's easy to see anyway. Uh, and then if you look at the fluorescein in this picture, it looks really beautiful. So you, again, perhaps a little more easily actually can see this ischemic, ischemic areas here, really, really dark through here, and sort of all dark around through here. And then the abnormal blood vessels sort of light up really early on because um, they're arterial kind of blood vessels, so they light up. And they, if you took another photo two minutes later, there'd be this really bright, intense white kind of cloud there because they leak as well. They're just sort of starting to leak a little bit, this sort of fuzziness here. And they tend to grow in the area between sort of vascularized retina and, and the avascular retina, which is kind of exactly where this, this is. So, um, uh, so this is a risk for uh, like vitreous hemorrhage and stuff basically now he's got this. So, um, uh, and it's all driven by VEGF being secreted by kind of these areas or maybe not from in here because there's probably no useful retina here, but certainly at the edges of this, 
the retinal will be secreting VEGF and then that prompts these new blood vessels to grow. Oh, we zoom in again. Uh, so what's happened since that last picture? Some laser, hasn't he? Yeah, so he's had laser. Um, and so again, this is another really useful thing um, with that wide field imaging. So um, you can tailor it exactly to where that ischemia is. So you really only want to treat the ischemic parts and maybe just outside them. And otherwise you're treating retina that doesn't really need to be treated. And, and you know, each one of those is a little bit of retina missing and a bit of damage. And whilst it's the peripheral retina and um, probably isn't going to be too visually significant, uh, if you can limit your treatment to the areas that need it, it's just more precise and, and, and overall better for the patient. So, um, so um, this has come down a little lower than maybe you needed because it seemed to be more ischemic here, but um, certainly all through these areas it's had really nice laser. And I don't know if you guys see it as well, but the, these blood vessels have sort of become a bit thicker and sort of kind of I call them budded at the end. And there's less of the little loops of them, um, so it's sort of responded, it's sort of shrunk down a bit and it's less frond-like. And if you did a fluorescein, it would probably be less leaky as well. So it sort of becomes a more mature, smaller vessel uh, and less risk of causing vitreous hemorrhage. Oh, zoom in again. Uh, yeah, maybe you can see that there, but better. Um, so he'll just now be watched, and um, uh, yeah, so as I said, the inflammation all resolved, both the vasculitis and all the, the mild vitritis. Um, and then, so he's off his prednisone now, so we'll just have to see whether his inflammation recurs. Um, he got that retinal near vasculization, and so had the PRP, but he's still got great vision, so we're just trying to, trying to keep it that way for him. Uh, so does anyone have any questions about that case? Yes. It's starting to resolve and one person is inflated with low level 2 and mm. another one would look like they were being inflated. If um, a vascular had been used at that point, would the blood vessels resolve? Would that kind of treatment be considered? Um, no, not prophylactically, because you probably couldn't predict whether it would happen or not. Because it's not, that wasn't, I wouldn't have thought that's that big an area of ischemia. Like if you see a diabetic patient who has, who maybe he doesn't even have proliferative diabetic retinopathy yet, if you do, and which we don't do very often, but if we did a fluorescein on them, there's quite large areas of retinal non-perfusion um, that would, not one big area, but lots of little areas that um, might not, you know, might be even quite a lot bigger than that, and they, they still don't have, so I don't think you can really tell necessarily by the amount of, <coughs> Certainly the more ischemia, the more likely it is, but I don't think you could tell from that amount that it was definitely going to happen. Um, uh, and, but do, giving a vaccine wouldn't have improved the blood. So basically, by the time he presented, he was, that, that retina was probably all dead and toast and, and there was nothing more you could do. Like restoring the flow with giving steroid to reduce that inflammation and get, trying to get the blood vessel open, is, that was probably the only way of trying to get more perfusion. You could use a vaccine to make that New, new vessel go away, but it would just come back again. Uh, it would go away and come back and go away and come back like it would only temporarily work. And it's small enough and reduced enough now with the laser that it's unlikely to cause trouble. Um, uh, so, yeah, so, yeah, it, yeah, you would have an immediate and very significant effect on it, but it, it, you wouldn't want to do it long term. There'd be no, 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 no reason to really. Does anyone have ask any other questions? Uh, so yeah, so I, I, again, it's sort of a rare case, but um, yeah, I guess just in general thinking about uveitis and the, and the anatomical classification is quite useful, um, partly about how um, serious it is, because it's not always serious. Um, it can look like he was 6'5", and you know, I don't, I don't know how serious you think that looked, but you know, he had good vision, just a few floaters and 6'5", and actually that was a far more serious thing than you know, a person with two plus hours in the atrial chamber and a red sore eye with HLA B27 uveitis, so you know, it's... Um, the sore painful eye isn't always the one that's, um, that you need to worry about. Um, and yeah, and using that, um, that anatomical um, sort of categorization can help you work out what it might be, or at least how concerned you should be about it. Um, and then, like, as I mentioned, we like to include infectious causes, and that's kind of getting into all the blood tests and things that we do. Um, and yeah, and I guess um, hopefully it sort of again showed how useful we find wide field imaging. And I know some of you guys have, have some of those devices as well. And you know, obviously that's a, again a slightly rare reason, but you know, monitoring diabetic retinopathy, um, looking at retinal schesis, peripheral nevi, you know, all these things. You know, Tim, you doing that all the time as well. You know, um, it just it's amazing how getting a repeatable test where you can monitor and just provides that much more reassurance than 
looking at the last doctor's drawing or explanation of it and trying to work out whether it's the same or, or change. So um, it's yeah, really, really helped retinal management hugely. Uh, so that's all my cases. That's right. Thank you. Thank you.